Okay, chapter 12 deals with uh, fungi. Remember in the last chapter we had some uh, organisms that were kind of fungus-like, and we had some that were not so fungus-like. Uh, we talked about the water moles and the slime moles. In this one we're going to talk about the things that usually when you talk about fungus, everybody kind of thinks about mushrooms. Okay? And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, so this part, as we will learn later on, this big part at the top, under, on the underside are little like fins going out from the stalk to the outside edge. And that on these fins, these gills we call them, is where there's little spores that are being produced. So that's how they can reproduce themselves. Okay, when it comes to eating mushrooms, not necessarily this one, uh, probably, but you're eating primarily the stalk part. Okay, so uh, the study of fungus is called mycology, uh, and anything to do with with uh, a fungus, you know, they often have that myco in front of it, indicating that it has something to do with a fungus. Um, now, fungi, we. Uh, it says here are eukaryotic cells. Okay, what was eukaryotic again? How many times we have this and keep having it over and over again? To be a eukaryotic cell, what has to be true? I do have your sticks over here so I can start calling on some of you. Some, if you have your notes filled out, this shouldn't be that hard. But uh, this one might be a little harder because you have to remember. But what are eukaryotic cells? You know, it's funny, everybody goes for that one first, it's just the opposite. The eukaryotic are the ones that have membrane-bound nucleus and membrane-bound and non-membrane-bound organelle, okay? But they have their nucleus has a membrane around it. And then um, they have their organelle, some are bound by, by membrane, some aren't. Okay, uh, going on. Now, the first one we want to talk about that is mentioned in the book is ergo of rye. It's a fungus that grows on the head of a rye plant. Rye is kind of like wheat, okay? It has seeds. This would be like the stalk of the wheat going over here. Maybe over here would be the, like the ground, and it would have its own leaves that it used for photosynthesis to carry, generate food that's going to be stored in the seeds. In the seed head, we call that, are going, uh, if the conditions are right uh, and this spore has landed in here, you can have some fungus growing in that, okay, which is going to damage the seed. But if you're harvesting this and not careful, you could end up um, taking that grain, and it's usually made into flour. Uh, have any of you eaten rye bread? Okay, rye bread, that it's related to this, not necessarily this same variety of rye that we grow in the U.S., but it's rye. And, uh, but if you had harvested these heads in there uh, and you weren't careful, you could get some of these fungus, um, the ergo of rye, in the flour. And if you ate that, one of the symptoms that you have, well, first of all, it's the people who have it, they refer to it as St. Elmo's fire. Uh, I mean, it feels like you're, you're, you feel like you're on a fire. Uh, like it says there, you have a burning sensation in your limbs. Um, it will cause uh, blood vessel constriction. In other words, it will restrict the flow of blood. And if it is sufficiently a, a large amount, it will restrict the flow of blood like to your extremities, particularly your fingers. And when your cells don't get enough blood flow, they will begin to die. And eventually they will turn black. So in other words, when they start turning black, you have gangrene. Okay? Those cells you can't revive. You're just going to have to cut it off. Okay? So 
it, you know, it's serious, you know, what, what it can do. It won't necessarily, you know, kill everybody, but you may have fingers missing on your hands or toes missing on your feet uh, from that. But that's caused by this fungus that's growing on the wheat plant, on the rye plant. Uh, now, there have been outbreaks of this where the weather conditions were just right for this to really multiply and spread to a lot of the crop uh, during that time. You can see even once most recently. Uh, so in other words, it's not something that's a problem all the time, like you know some of the infectious diseases that we uh, studied or had you do reports on, but this is something that every once in a while the conditions are just right to make it a big deal. Uh, now, the, uh, the chemicals that are actually produced by the fungus uh, can be, it says, used for LSD. Now, you probably aren't, old, you know, maybe old enough or even maybe even know about. What is LSD? LSD is actually a drug, a hallucinogenic drug. And it comes from that fungus. Uh, now the drug of choice is not LSD. This was kind of was probably most popular back in like 60s and 70s, 1960s and 60s and 70s. I mean, and um, but now you know we have people that are on meth and you know other things like that that probably are they can make their own. Uh, people always trying to make it and. Every once in a while, catching their house on fire and killing themselves, uh, making it. But it's you know a lot more readily accessible. So you, but uh, I did read that there's a kind of a resurgence of LSD again. Um, you know, it's a fad drug. Let's say it that way. But it also can be used for medicinal purposes. Maybe we do want to constrict the flow of blood to an area. So that you know to, to reduce bleeding. Now, obviously, we're not going to give enough to affect the whole body. We might just apply it to a certain area to restrict blood flow till we can get control of something, maybe. Okay. Now, uh, fungi can also damage crops, particularly food crops that we have. Um, farmers are constantly having to deal with that. Last year. Um, with all the rain that we had uh, in spring, probably not as much of a problem as having a very wet summer. We had a wet spring, and then it kind of turned dry uh, toward the end of July. We did have a big amount of rain at the first part of August, but then for the rest of it, it was pretty dry. And right now, we're in another dry spell right now. It, you know, things just kind of average out. Uh, really wet and then really dry. But when the conditions, when the uh, orange, you know, when the apples, for instance, this apple is setting on the tree, uh, they can get these fungi, fungi growing on the peeling of the apple. Okay, and it does damage the fruit to a certain extent. I mean, if you peel the fruit, this is probably not an apple you're going to just take a bite out of, you'll probably peel it first before you eat it. Uh, the flesh inside, usually it isn't damaged by that. But, you know, it kind of limits how you eat it or how you sell it. Uh, now, as far as, you know, the amount of crops that are damaged by fungi, only bacteria damage crops more than fungi do. So typically, like crops, there would be, I mean, almost anything that we grow for a crop could have a fungus that uh, affects it. Uh, in uh, if, if what we call like dry land farming, where they have things like wheat and barley and oats and rye and stuff like that, uh, if, the, if it's too wet, they can have trouble with uh, fungus. Uh, one of them is, have you ever heard of rust? Not the rust on, on metals, but rust on 
grass and rust on leaves of, of uh, because like wheat and, and oats and barley and things like that are actually types of grasses. You know, they're in that same family. And uh, so they can have rust. And it kind of looks reddish looking, but it's a fungus that grows on it and it damages the leaves. So now there's not as much potential for carrying on photosynthesis and making as much food. So it's gonna reduce the size of the seeds or the number of seeds that uh, a crop produces. Okay, now, um, in, a, in addition to damaging crops, they can affect us, for instance. Um, how many of you have ever had athlete's foot? Nobody in here, really? That's pretty good. Uh, I think it would be different if we had our own showers at school, but most of you go home to shower. Uh, and if you've been on enough missions trips or uh, retreats, you'll probably end up getting it. Uh, I think I've gotten it every time I've been on a retreat where we had to share showers with uh, particularly students, because usually they're athletes that have these things. Uh, but it grows in between your toes like that. Uh, it, uh, it, it lives off of the dead skin that you have in between your toes. You typically don't have it on the, you know, like on the top of your foot or on the bottom of your foot, but in between your toes where it's moist, okay? Uh, and all you have to do is just um, apply some an antifungal cream in between there. In a few days, it's gone, you know. But it's living, the conditions between your toes is, is just ideal. The dead squint skin between your toes, it wants to live off of, and uh, it's nice and moist. Usually your feet are always a little bit sweaty. Uh, even in winter, you're sweating right now, whether you, you know, you're, you're constantly sweating. Uh, and uh, so it's perfect conditions. The next one here is called ringworm. Now, it kind of looks like it's in the shape of a ring, it, and some people think you know, that it's actually a worm that causes it. It's not, it's actually a fungus. Um, when I was in high school, um, there was, I think, like four or five of us guys that always would sit together in chapel, always in exactly the same order. Uh, my friend uh, who passed away a couple years ago in, in Oregon sat on the end, I was always mixed. Uh, the guy, my friend from Washington was next, and then I think next to him was one from California. Uh, but we always sat next to each other, and in chapel, you know, we'd sit there for quite a while, and we had theater seats, you know, kind of flopped down. And um, so we were sitting there, and then they had an armrest in between that we would share, okay? Well, we kind of share it, so in other words, his arm was on the armrest, and my arm was on the armrest. Well, my friend, the one sitting on the end got ringworm. Okay, and I don't think he did anything about it. You know, it's just no big deal. You know, uh, just a little small patch. And but when we would put our arms together, you know, the body heat would make our arms sweat a little bit, and so the spores from this spread to my skin, which caused me to get ringworm. Now just. We, the same stuff they use for athletes, but you put it on that, and it'll make it go away too. But that is a fungus that grows up on you. Uh, there are other kinds of funguses that can grow in different parts of your body. Um, there, um, when, when we lived in uh, Phoenix, there was something that uh, some people would get. It was a fungus that actually grew in the, the dirt the desert dirt. I don't know how it did it. This may be only when it got wet. And if you stirred up the dirt and breathed in this dust from the spores, you might get something called valley fever. And it was, uh, I mean, it really, it, it kind of like, it give you flu-like symptoms, but it didn't go away as quickly as the flu does, which, you know, is typically like a week or two. Now, my brother-in-law who lived there, and he, he had actually been digging uh, a trench for, for a, um, I think it was an orphanage or something like that, or 
Yeah. Uh, and they, uh, he got breathed in this dust, and it took him almost a year to get over it. So it's, it's just a long process of getting over it. But it was also caused by a fungus that he only, this fungus was growing in his lungs, which is harder to treat things that are growing in your lungs. Now, what are some beneficial fungi? Okay, well, some of them we eat, right? Do you eat mushrooms? Or how many of you like mushrooms? Any? Not many. Not, it's funny, we, in the other class we had more, we did have a couple of you that like mushrooms, but in the other class there was more. I'm not particularly a fan of mushrooms. Uh, to me, they taste musty. I don't know if you know what musty means. Like if you've been in an in old basement, some, some old house in the basement that musty, that's what it tastes like to me. So I, I'm not particularly a fan of it. And what made it even worse was that when I was in college, uh, at the state college in, in Oklahoma, uh, they often had mashed potatoes and they only made one kind of gravy. It was mushroom gravy. It didn't have mushrooms in it, but it always tastes like mushrooms. So I got you know really tired of the taste of mushrooms. Uh, but you know, can I eat them? Yeah, I can eat them when they're on pizza. I'm not gonna pick it off. It's, it is what it is, you know? Uh, now, we also use some of the fungi for making uh, certain kinds of cheese, uh, like Swiss cheese or cheddar. Those are probably the ones that maybe we, you have eaten. Uh, I don't know, any of you have eaten Roquefort and Camembert? Maybe eaten those kind of cheeses? Yeah, not many people eat those. Uh, I think it's kind of like an acquired taste. You have to learn to like some of these things. I think coffee, to me, is one of those. I can't imagine anybody liking coffee, but there are apparently a lot of people that do. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a Starbucks and a Scooters and things like that. People learn how to, to drink it. But to me, it's, to me, it tastes nasty. Uh, in my mind, I picture it, somebody taking their old gym socks and rinsing them out of the water and squeezing it into a cup and feeding it to somebody. That's, that's what goes on in my mind, I'll have to tell you that. So that's why I just can't, it just, to me it just tastes nasty, but you know, if you like it, that's okay. You know, it's an acquired taste, okay? And these uh, are acquired tastes, or like some people like blue cheese. I mean, to me that, I mean, just before you even put it in your mouth, you can already smell it pretty strong. Uh, but uh, another beneficial fungus are, uh, is as an antibiotic. It was discovered that um, they were, they, you know those, we talked about those petri dishes with auger in it that you could grow, you could culture um, bacteria. Well, some people discovered that on their culture dishes, there were some places where they had swabbed it like this, but there'd be these circles where no bacteria would grow at all. And they discovered what it was, it was the penicillin mold was actually growing right there. And one of its byproducts actually is an antibiotic. We use it as an antibiotic. Um, now, have any of you ever had a penicillin injection? Okay, it's, it's almost like never used anymore. To me, when I was, um, before I went to kindergarten, I was sick a lot with, um, with usually like ear infections was a common thing I typically have, and I get quite sick. And uh, my parents would take me in. Uh, I think I remember one time being hospitalized overnight because I was so sick. But they would give me a shot of penicillin, and often if I wasn't hospitalized, I'd, they would drive like 40 miles to home, because we live way out in the country, uh, and by the time I got home, I was feeling good. I was feeling like normal again. I was playing uh, just like nothing had happened to me. So to me, it was the magic drug. Uh, but they don't use it because a lot of people are allergic to it. Okay? Uh, here's some fungus growing on an orange. You probably know that you've left an orange uh, a little bit too long before you've eaten it, if it has that growing on the end of it. The, the beauty of that is if you take the peeling off, there's probably not much on the inside that could affect you. you know, it just, it's growing on the outside. Because uh, the, 
very outside skin of the orange is basically dead anyway. Uh, and then, remember the lab that we did with the yeast? Yeast is actually a kind of fungus. Um, and there turns out to be really two kinds of yeast that, two primary varieties of yeast. There's the one that people use to make bread and things that need, uh, like dough that needs to rise. Uh, we call that baker's yeast. Uh, now, when yeast um, reproduced, remember it made those bubbles? What were those bubbles made out of? What were the bubbles made out of? Remember that from the lab? It was carbon dioxide, right. And the other thing it produces, every time you have raw bread dough, it has this in it. What's the other thing? Alcohol. It actually produces alcohol. Um, if you, um, I've, I've heard of this, where um, some bakeries will make dough, and sometimes they, they make more dough than they can actually maybe deal with in a day, or there's something, maybe they discover something's maybe kind of wrong with the dough. They don't want to actually bake it and sell it as a product, so they just, they have this raw bread dough they need to get rid of. And some of the uh, farmers who raise pigs, hogs, uh, will go around and, and buy, or not, they won't buy, they'll take this raw bread dough off their hand and feed it to their pigs. The pigs will eat the dough and get drunk from the alcohol that's in the dough. Now, when you bake the bread, what happens to the alcohol? It evaporates, okay? So you, by the time you eat the bread, alcohol evaporates very easily. And in the process of baking bread, you're trying to get rid of some of the moisture in it because it's not doughy. When you eat it, is it? It's it's much drier, so you're getting rid of the water, but you're also getting rid of all the alcohol. And yes, the carbon dioxide is leaving, but it's already made its bubble, so you know it'll, you'll have all these holes in the bread. So there's baker's yeast, and then they use uh, there's a kind of yeast that they use for making alcoholic beverages. We call that brewer's yeast, and they each one can tolerate uh, each one. Remember. Alcohol is kind of like a, a byproduct of them carrying on life. Um, and if they have too much waste of this waste product, it can limit their ability to grow and reproduce. So bread will only get up to a certain percent alcohol and it'll stop. Just because the, the yeast cells don't want to reproduce anymore. On uh, brewer's yeast, they can tolerate a little higher level. And so when you're making these alcoholic beverages, it just has more alcohol in it. Now, another uh, beneficial uh, type of fungus is called the uh, mycorrhizae. And uh, if you've ever dug up plants, once in a while around the, the roots of plants, you'll see all this fuzzy stuff growing on the roots. Now, your first thought might be, that's going to harm the plant. You know, something's attacking the roots, and the roots are dying, and the plant's going to die ultimately. Actually, it turns out to be just the opposite. There is a symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic means both organisms benefit. The plant's benefiting from this relationship. The fungus is benefiting from this relationship. The fungus living on the roots of the plant increase the surface area of the plant where it can absorb water. So that it, it can, the soil can actually get drier and it can still take in water into the roots. So it's absorbing water and helping the, the roots to take in more water than they would ordinarily. Uh, now, the fungus benefits by the root supplying it nourishment and kind of protection, a place to, to live and survive. So they're both benefiting from this relationship. So it's called a symbiotic relationship. 
Uh, there are other examples of symbiotic relationships. Um, have you ever seen um, animals, like quite often in um, Like, like in the safaris and stuff like that, where they have animals and then they have these little white birds perched on their back. That's a symbiotic relationship. That little white bird is eating grubs and, and pests that this animal has. And they have a lot better eyesight. Quite often you see them on maybe on top of, uh, pictures I've seen are like on top of a rhino. Rhino don't have good eyesight. But the birds do. So if the birds all of a sudden quickly fly away, the rhino knows there's danger somewhere here. So they both benefit from that relationship. <laughs> the pests of the rhino feed the birds, and the birds scare the rhino uh, or warn the rhino that danger is nearby. You know, and you can come up with all kinds kinds of them. You've probably seen the one with uh, what is it, alligators and crocodiles where the, they'll have their mouth wide open and here's this bird hopping around inside the mouth. What they're doing is they're picking out food part, food stuff inside between the teeth, kind of cleaning their teeth for them. The, the crocodile or alligator, I can't remember which one it is, could just munch down on them and eat them. But it's a beneficial relationship for both of them. One keeps the mouth clean <laughs> and the other one provides food. You know. So those are called symbiotic relationships where both benefit. Now, parasitic relationship is one where only one benefits and the other one's harmed. Okay. We sometimes use that about like human relationships sometimes. We have one person in, in a relationship that only is there, they derive all their energy from the other person, the other person's actually harmed by them beating around them. They're a parasite. Okay. Now, saprophyte was the dead ones. Usually you don't have a relationship with a dead person. Uh, okay, um, so it can actually increase the surface area of the, of the root by a significant amount. This is an example of, if you've ever been, um, like walk into the woods or a forest, you will sometimes see trees that have fallen down. Um, I know that, uh, like the last time I saw this, when we were, when we were working up at uh, Camp Calvin Crest, and uh, one of our jobs was were to uh, cut up trees for firewood that they were going to use in uh, you know the next summer in camping around the, you know you have campfires and stuff like that every night, and so we were cutting the wood for that. But there were a lot of trees that were down that would have this kind of stuff growing on the bark. Okay. Now, sometimes, so because this is dead, this is going to be living off the dead, decaying plant matter. Quite often, the log on the inside wasn't that bad. You know, you could cut it up and split it. If it goes too long, then it gets all, you know, mushy and rotty on the inside. Okay? So they are decomposing the tree. So that way, every tree that's ever fallen down isn't still laying there thousands of years later. Usually in a couple of years, it'll be gone. It'll just turn to compost on the, uh, you know, like on the forest floor, and the rains will soak these nutrients down in the ground. The trees will benefit from it, and from you know some other plant dying. Now, what are some characteristics of fungi? Well, first of all, they don't produce their own food, so obviously they lack chlorophyll. So you're going to usually see them kind of pale colored, uh, like a lot of the mushrooms that pop up in your yard maybe are you know kind of whitish looking, or most of them. That fungus or that uh, mushroom that I showed you on the first page of the slides, probably not the normal color you will see, but they're usually light colored. Uh, they lack true tissues. What was our definition of a tissue? Group of cells that what? Yeah, they work together for a common function, right? And it, so they don't even have tissue. So every, kind of like all the cells are kind of on their own doing this. Now, can they live together and benefit by living together? Yes, but 
they're not, you, you don't have some cells doing this for other cells. Okay? Now, uh, they are not like plants. They don't have cellulose. They have um, their cell wells made of something else. Now, if you look at this word, what would be your normal uh, pronunciation? How would you think it might be normally pronounced? How would you try it? Yeah, like chitin or chitin. Okay, this is one of those few times where CH actually has a K sound. So it's like chitin. Okay? So it looks like it looks like chitin, but it's chitin. And um, another organism that has chitin is if you look at um, crayfish, you know the little shell around the crayfish or lobsters, uh, or shrimp, they, their, their exoskeleton is made out of chitin. So it's, now, is it identical to it? Probably not, but it's very similar. So we call it by the same name. Now, how do fungi uh, carry on nutrition? Well, first of all, they don't make their own food, so they have to be heterotrophic. They have to live off of other organisms. They have to live off of other organisms. So, most of them are saprophytes, which means they're living off of what kind of organisms? They're death, okay? So that's why we would see them growing on a log. Or, uh, so they're saprophytes. Um, some of them are parasites. Like the ringworm on my arm was clearly a parasite. I was not dead. Yeah, I'm still alive. It was growing off of me. Uh, in my, so they would function as a parasite. Now, some of them have dimorphism. Di means what? You put di in front of it, it means two, right? It means two. Uh, like carbon dioxide has two oxygens. Dimorphism and morph means what? If, you, if something morphs, it does what? kind of changes its form, right? So this is something that can exist in two different forms depending on uh, what kind of environment. Now, if the, in other words, if the environment changes, they might change form, or you might see it in a different form. Now, they uh, uh, don't make their own food, so they have to digest plant material, and we're looking at here maybe more like a decomposer, would be a mushroom growing on the side of a log. Um, the mushroom is going to produce some enzymes that will break up the cellulose in the log into smaller pieces. Then it will take the smaller pieces inside, like a food vacuole, like we've talked about before, and then finish digesting it and then uh, uh, absorbing the nutrients from that. But it starts digesting it partially outside of the cell. So that's why we call it external digestion. Now, most fungi require oxygen uh, for metabolism. In other words, they need to have oxygen to survive. Deprive them of oxygen, they'll die. That's what most of them do. Uh, they all require moisture. You can always tell uh, if you have mushrooms growing in your yard, usually that's a clue about what? You know, if you have mushrooms growing in your yard and you did it before, it's usually a clue about what? Yeah, you had more water, maybe too much water, you know, maybe too much rain, you maybe been running your sprinkler system and it's rained on top of it all. And so now we have too much. So fungi, particularly like mushrooms, they like it really wet. Um, there are people that actually grow mushrooms for eating. And uh, they, what is it? They, they make these, these beds uh, where the mushrooms can grow. It's usually in the dark. 
and it's really moist. And uh, but you know, they do like moisture, you know, so that they, they like it where it's uh, quite moist. And, they, and you know, they don't. It doesn't can't be cold either. So you need to have the right temperature. Okay, so now let's look at, take an example like a, a mushroom that pops up out of the ground overnight. Uh, it, if we were to look at the structure of that, this would be kind of what we would see. It has tiny little filaments that are cells kind of connected to each other. Sometimes the cells are, there's actually a division from one cell to the next, and then some of them, they're all, it, it's almost like there's all one big cell. They function in individual separate parts. You know, they'll still have a nucleus here and a nucleus here, but they're not physically divided. So if they're physically divided, they say that they are septate. A septum is a wall dividing something. For instance, your heart is divided in two halves by a wall, okay? A septum. So we septate is just kind of using more like an adjective uh, here. Okay, these are just walls dividing the hypha. The hypha are the filaments, the strands of cells, uh, which can branch out, as it shows here, or they can be all bunched together in other locations, or you can just have a whole mass of them growing at once. And then, like I said, there's some of these filaments may not have them divided into sec sections. They, they're functioning as separate sections, but they're not physically divided. Okay, now, uh, so all of this uh, hypha growing down in here, we, admit, we call all of that together, we call it the mycelium, uh, or mycelia, which means more than one. Uh, but in here, you know, you can have, they can become really all intertwined with each other. They're intertwined so closely that it looks like a, a solid stock. Like if you've ever eaten mushrooms, you know that they sliced off the mushrooms. You're slicing right through this section right here. You can't see the individual hypha because they're that small. But they're, there's a whole bunch of them wadded up in kind of like one spot. Now, the hypha, uh, some of the hypha, function kind of like roots do for plants. They provide attachment so they don't get pushed away or washed away or blown away. Um, and they also absorb uh, probably some nutrients you know, by digesting the, the food that's around it. Uh, maybe water as well. We have Hostoria. Uh, which are these structures here. Hostoria are hypha that actually penetrate through the wall of a cell. This uh, over here would be like the, uh, the, the host cells. Like for instance, when the, the ringworm was growing on my arm, uh, it could have this growing down inside of the cells, absorbing nutrients right out of the cell. Okay, now that's not going to be good for the cell uh, necessarily, um, but that it also provides a, a kind of an attachment too uh, as well. Then in, if we take this picture over here, um, sometimes we will have structures that will pop up above the surface and their purpose is to reproduce the mushroom so that you have more spores that can be blown around or washed away and have more uh, fun dry, okay? And on the end of them, they have these sporophores that form spores, little, kind of like pollen, maybe more like seeds than they are like pollen grains, but they can grow uh, more fun dry, okay? Now, in between these, you know, you can have stolons. I think we used that word once before. Remember when we talked about strawberries? and they can reproduce themselves 